Our next speaker is an Iowa State Senator representing Iowa Senate District 19. A lifelong Iowan, he's a small business owner and an entrepreneur at heart and spent the last seven years growing a small business. It's got uh, three locations, it's called Acceleration Iowa. Graduated from Drake University Law School in 2012 and passed the bar in 2013. He's an attorney with a local law firm in Des Moines. But now let me get to the really good stuff. Knowing that this is a cyclone state. <laughs> he's also a graduate of Iowa State University where he was a three-year starter as wide receiver for the Iowa State Cyclone football team. He finished his eligibility ranked in the top 10 in all-time receiving yards and all-time receptions. Please join me in welcoming, and I mean a Cyclone State welcoming, to Senator Jack Whitworth. Thank you for having me, and especially to Shane and Captain Native Thoughts for putting on this uh, wonderful day and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, he invited me to uh, talk about, um, strangely enough, one of my favorite topics in government, and that's the budget, uh, because I think that is where the most important decisions are made. And um, so he asked me to come give an update on that. I think he's still working on a PowerPoint. I can go through it. I have the PowerPoint up here. I can go through it. Um, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of facts whenever you deal with the budget, and so um, that's why I put the PowerPoint together, but I can try to do my best uh, without that. Could you make it available after? Yeah, sure, I can, yeah, I can send it out and, and uh, get it to everyone if, if needed. Um, so I'm going to talk about the budget in general and some of the concepts that you need to know as Iowans. Um, some of the, the terms and, and information you'll hear from legislators and, and um, uh, things that in general you need to know. And then I'm going to specifically talk about the 2015-2016 budget and some of the challenges that we face um, going forward with our state budget. A little bit of background on myself. I grew up in Grinnell and uh, I came from a very apolitical family. Um, other than a grandpa that was a mayor of a small town in Iowa, uh, I didn't grow up following politics at all. I grew up caring about football and sports, and that was about it. Uh, it wasn't until after I graduated Iowa State and I started my own small business that I started to see the impact that government can have on our lives. And I uh, got a little more interested, started to pay attention, and that's when I became very frustrated with where our country was going. I thought we were suffering from a severe lack of leadership from the top all the way on down. And uh, in the middle of law school, I got a phone call, and it was a phone call um, right in the middle of law school finals. And if anyone's a lawyer in here, you know that's like the worst time in the world of your life, studying for, for tests where your entire grade relies on that one essay question. So I get a phone call and they say, you know, Jack, our state senator's gonna resign, would you be interested in running? And I said, absolutely not. I'm in the middle of law school, in the middle of finals, I had a baby that was four days from being born, our first one. Uh, my business was busy in that time of year, and I just said, I can't do it, and I hung up. And then I tried to study for my tests, again. And it started to eat it, and I knew that um, if we were going to turn around our state and our country, uh, people need to step up and be leaders. And, and that's when I made a decision that uh, I would try to run for that spot. Um, and really what it came down to is, at the time I said, it's just not a good time. I can't do it right now. And I started to think about, when is a good time? I thought, well, maybe four years from now. Well, I'll have two, maybe three kids by then, uh, all young. That's not a better time. Well, how about 12 years from now? And that's when your kids are starting to get uh, into activities and, and, and you're even busier. And I thought, well, how about 20, 25 years? Well, that's when I'm starting to settle down and relax a little. And I came to con the conclusion that there's never a right time to do something big. And you just have to set your priorities of faith and family, whatever you want to prioritize after that, and, and give up the things that don't matter. And so that's what I did. And I ran for office and, and obviously won, and I'm finishing my first term in the Iowa Senate right now, uh, up for re-election this year. And so, as we talk about the budget, I want to start with a quote that um, I always I teach to, I, I talk to high school government classes every year, every semester. And the very first thing I, I share with them is a quote from 400 BC. And it was a guy named Pericles. And uh, I, I'm not sure who this guy was, but his quote is as relevant today as it was 
2,500 years ago. And what he said is, just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. Just because you don't care about politics doesn't mean politics doesn't care about you. And what that means to me, at least, is you can say it doesn't matter. I, you know, Whatever they do with the capital is their business. I have other things to worry about. But if you have that mindset, it will. you do so at your own peril. If you're a business owner, if you're any individual citizen, uh, and you have kids in the school system, if you're not paying attention, the legislators, Congress, they're paying attention to you, and they're regulating you, they're, they're taxing you, they're changing laws that affect you. And I share that with every high school class. Um, I don't think we have a big problem with that in this room, uh, because you're here on a Saturday um, at, this, at this event. But uh, I, I think it's something to, to share uh, with, with anyone else that you think should get more involved. So when we talk about the budget, getting into the generals of the budget, um, the budget is to government kind of like the sun is the solar system. I mean, government does not exist without a budget. And we can argue about how big or small that should be. I frankly think it should be a lot smaller. But the bottom line is it needs to be there. And um, everything that we do in government really revolves and goes through that, that budget. Um, they're really there to do three things. It's to plan what we think are priorities, um, to control those programs and administer those programs, and then come back and look at them and see how effective they are. And if they're not, we change them. The budgeting process is one of the most misunderstood in all of government. It's a very complicated process. And I would say, after this presentation, um, and hopefully if I get the PowerPoint to you, um, you will know more than a large majority of our legislators when it comes to the budget because it's just a very complicated thing, and it's not real interesting to a lot of people, uh, but uh, I think it's important. In fact, when I um, finally got the, the seniority or the ability to request a budget, that budget committee that I wanted to be on, or uh, I'm sorry, no, any kind of a committee I wanted to be on, I requested the appropriations committee because I knew any priority, any major bill has to go through that committee. And if you're on that committee, that's where you can really uh, control the, the growth of government or shrink government. And if you're not on that, you know, you don't have a say in that. And so that's the one I wanted to be on. And that's, I was named uh, two years ago to our ranking member in the Senate on the Appropriations Committee. And what that means is I'm in the minority, but that's the top ranking on the budget in the Senate, a Republican caucus. So um, that's, the, that's the committee that I really wanted to be on. Uh, but in general, uh, just some background on the state budget. We operate on a fiscal year, start um, uh, J July 1st through June 30th. So it's not matched up with your annual year. It's, it's offset July 1st through June 30th. Um, Iowa Code requires that we have um, a balanced budget, that we cannot spend more than 99% of the revenue we bring in. The important thing to understand about that is Iowa Code requires that, not the Iowa Constitution. And so when you talk about people that says we have to do a balanced budget is required, that's kind of true. But anytime Iowa code requires it, that means as a legislature, we can just not withstand that and spend more money. And so it's not as, as foolproof and, and hardcore as having a constitutional amendment. And so when you hear uh, people like me saying we need a balanced budget amendment in the state of Iowa, it's because the just putting it in the code is not good enough, uh, in my opinion, if we want to have a truly balanced budget. I will talk a little bit more about that 99% rule later, but, um, uh, and, and there's some faults with that that I think we need to correct as well, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, so one of the most important things that you probably hear um, is the REC, the Revenue Estimating uh, Conference. And this was established in 1987 um, as a way to determine how much money the state government would have so we know how much we can spend or, or what we can do with that money. And before that time, the, the governor and the legislature kind of came up with their own numbers uh, when they're setting their budget. And you can see how that'd be a problem. When the governor you know, goes through a certain formula and has one number, the legislature has a different uh, number. And so uh, they established this in 1987 so that we could have one solid number that all parties would go off of when they're planning the budget. Uh, and, and really, when the, when the REC is doing that, um, they look at a lot of things, the cash receipts, how the economy is doing, how the ag economy is doing. They look at a whole range of different things, but it's like anything else. It's somewhat of a guess. You know, it's just their best economic guess of what's going to happen in the next year. Um, the, it meets quarter, the REC meets quarterly, but the two important things, uh, the two important meetings that the REC has, the first one is in December. December 15th, they have to meet, and they have to come up with a number. And that's the number that the legislature will use for the next year when we're setting our budget. If, um, and then we meet again, they meet again in March in the middle of session. And during that time, if um, 
they use the lower of each number. So if the, if the December number is lower, we'll use that one. If the March number comes in lower, we'll use that one. And that way, uh, we have a little bit more conservative um, number when we're trying to work with the budget. Talking a little bit about um, our, our state budget, uh, we get our revenue in essentially three ways. We have personal income tax, so anything, uh, any job that you have, your kids have, your parents have, we, we take that income tax. We get about 52% of our money from income tax. Uh, we also get money from sales tax. Anytime you go buy something at the store, it has that sales tax on it, and that's about 33% of our state revenue. Then we have a corporate income tax of about 7% of our total revenue. And then the rest of it is very small, one, one, one and a half percent or less. So it's really those three things, sales tax, income tax, and corporate income tax that derives most of our, our revenue in the state. But when we're going through the budgeting process, um, it really starts with the governor. The governor will get the REC numbers, he'll talk to all of his directors, and he'll come out with a budget. And his budget by, def, uh, by state law has to be to the legislature by February 1st. And that way, uh, the legislature can start working on that budget. And uh, to get through the legislature, it has to have 51 uh, votes from the House, 46 from the Senate. And that sounds fairly easy, but getting that many people to agree on it can be a tough process. If you remember about three or four years ago, I believe it was my first year in the Senate, uh, we went to June 30th before we were able to pass the budget. And that was the last day that we had until the entire state government shut down before the new year started on July 1st. And so it can be a very, very complicated and hard process, uh, but uh, the bottom line has to pass through both chambers, obviously. Um, one of, um, I wanna talk about that 99% limitation again. I said it's not in the Constitution, which um, makes that a, a, you know, a problem. I think it needs to be in the Constitution. But the other thing that I believe is a fault of the 99% rule, and this is where if we had the numbers, um, it would be easier to understand, so bear with me as I talk numbers. Um, the 99% rule means we can spend 99% of all money we have available. So if you think about your household, you take your income that you make, you take your whole savings account, you take all your retirement accounts, all the money you have available to you, the state can spend 99% of that. Okay, so that means if we have 700 million in our state savings account like we do, that counts in the 99% rule. So um, take a year like this, we might we bring in about $7 billion. But if you count our savings account, we have $7.7 .7 billion. So we can spend 99% of $7.7 billion and still be okay under the law. And that's where you'll hear um, a lot of people, a lot of the Democrats when they're arguing their budget is that we're, we're, we're spending less than we have available. We're spending 99%. Well, that's if you wanted to spend every dollar we had, including all the money in our savings account. And so uh, it's important to understand the budget. Part of the reason the budget is so complicated is because um, stats can be skewed to however you want to, to skew them. And the Democrats are very good at messaging what, um, what message they want out there. And they want to try to act like fiscal conservatives. And one of the ways they do that is to say, well, we're only spending 94% or 95% of the money. That may be true, but they're spending 103% of the money we actually brought in that year. And so um, that's just one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about that 99% rule. And again, that is why I think we need a balanced budget amendment in Iowa so that it's foolproof, they can't not, not withstand it, but also it is 99% of the money we bring in, not the money we have available. And I think that, that is very important going forward. When you look at our, our state spending, 81% um, of our state spending comes from three things education, K, or preschool through um, K, uh, K, K through 12, look at the regions and community colleges, and then health and human services, Medicaid essentially. Those three things make up 81% of our budget. So if we're trying to really keep the cost of government down, those are the three things you look at. We just hold, heard Michael Ferris talk about the federal government. We have the same kind of issue here. It's just three different things. And um, you, can, you can play with that other 19% all you want. You're not gonna make a huge impact on it. It's really those three things. Um, some of the good news with the state of Iowa right now as we look, as I try to transition towards current day and, and going forward. Um, in 2010, part of the reason I wanted to run is because this state was in a disaster situation. You know, we, we're coming out of the Culver administration where we just had 10% across the board cuts. Uh, we had a $900 million structural deficit in our budget, and we were passing bills to pass debt onto our kids for 30 years. You know, 30 years from now, we're still paying for what both Governor Culver and the Democrat majorities passed. 
um, I thought we could do better. And, and in that time, since we um, took control as far as the governor and the House Republicans, we've completely turned that around. And so that's the good news. We turned that around. We went from a huge uh, structural deficit to $750 million in our savings account. And you hear a lot of people talk about the state surplus. You'll hear the governor talk about a state surplus. And um, I don't call it a surplus. I think a surplus is on any given year, how much you bring in, how much you spend, that's your surplus for the year. Um, in state government, they call the surplus the total amount of money we built up over several years into what I call a savings account. Okay, and so if you think about your own finances, the savings account total amount is what the state government calls a surplus. And so when you hear seven hundred million dollar surplus, that's not every year ongoing, just adding up. That's what we've accumulated over the last four years of being fiscally sound after the Colbert administration. And so. Um, uh, on top of that, so we have $750 million in that savings account. And on top of that, by state law, we're required to have 10% of our budget in cash reserves and our economic emergency fund. And so years ago, they determined that we need to have a certain amount that we have in cash reserve accounts, 2.5% of our budget, and then 7.5% of our budget in the economic reserve fund. So um, again, a lot of numbers here. Uh, but all in all, we have about $700 million in our reserve accounts, and we have about $700 million in our savings account, what I call them, what they call the surplus. So we have almost a billion and a half dollars extra. Okay, so that's the good news. We turned around the budget. Uh, we're, in, we're in good shape. Uh, we have money in our savings account. We have it in our reserve accounts. Um, and so we're in good shape. The concerns I have going forward um, that I've tried to express to as many people that will listen is just because we're good today doesn't mean we're good the next four or five years. And, and if you look at the numbers, you will see that. And um, we have three big budget drivers, things that make it very, very hard to shrink our state budget. And one of them is Medicaid expenses. Our partnership with the federal government on Medicaid uh, is going up roughly $100 million a year, and there's not a lot we can do about it at this point. Um, state worker salaries and benefits, um, you know, state workers, many of them are still getting completely free health care. Um, that cost is going up tremendously. Salaries are going up. Uh, so that's number two. That's about $100 million a year, too. And then school aid, our, our education money for K-12 through is going up about $100 million a year as well. So those three things are all going up about $100 million a year, which makes it difficult to rein in costs in other areas as well. Um, Going forward, so last year our budget spent exactly the same amount of money as we brought in. So what I call a surplus year over year, we spent exactly the same amount of money we brought in. Um, going forward, going into next year, we have about $555 million of built-in expenses. Okay, so you get a shame? Close? Got to forget all the good numbers here. Sorry. So, um, if we're even last year with our budget, spending exactly what we brought in, next year, before we even get to the capital, we have $553 million of built-in expenses. And that is due to bills we passed in the, in the last couple of years, education reform, property tax reform, school aid, uh, Medicaid, all those add up to the $550 million. So when we get to the capital, after you account for growth revenue, we're looking at $228 million, or $288 million, um, that we're going to need to balance if we want to have a balanced budget. And so even though we have our cash reserves, even though we have our savings account, if we don't want to dip into that savings account, we're going to have to find about $280 million to even that budget out. And, and I, for one, and the Republicans in the legislature have been committed the last four years to not spend more than we bring in. And so as we look at the challenges next session, whoever's in charge, whether uh, the Senate uh, Republicans can take the majority or not, we're facing a huge challenge next year as we're trying to balance the budget. And um, you're going to hear about budget fights next year in the legislature, and you're going to think, well, I, heard, I thought we had all this money. I thought we had this surplus. But we do. But we're still trying to spend less than we bring in. So I'm on about slide 28 or so. speech from Michael Ferris about the concerns. We all know the concerns. But from a state legislator's uh, 
vantage point, we have to be concerned about all the money that we spend that the federal government gives us. We spend about seven billion of our own money, our own state income, corporate income, sales tax money. We also get seven billion dollars from the federal government that they send back to us. It's our money, they just send it back to us to spend. So we have about 14 billion dollars total. Okay, yep, good slide there. Okay. And so one of the concerns I have is what's going on with Medicaid. Um, over the years, how Medicaid was set up years ago, they, they came up with something called the Fed Medicaid FMAP, and that stands for the Federal Medical Assistance Percentage. So when they wrote the Medicaid law, they said the federal government will kick in part and the states will kick in part. And part of how that formula was set up, they said the better the states do economically, the less the federal government's going to help. So Iowa, if you're doing good with your economics, your economy's doing well, your budget's doing good, we're going to give you less money and let you spend let you carry more of that cost. And so, as you can see over the years, from 2010, the federal government was spending, or, or, or kicking in about 63% of Medicaid. And as we got through the Culver administration disaster and, and turned our economy around, uh, we went from 63% to 61% to 58%, and now they're only paying 54%. And each one percentage point equals about $35 million. So as Iowa's done better economically, the federal government says, great, you're going to pay more of your own money. And so you can see some of our challenges in the budget. As we do good as a state, they punish us. This is just one part of our partnership with the federal government. There's $7 billion of money they send us. And so as a legislator, I'm extremely concerned if that money will be there, if they can afford it, um, and, and how that's going to affect our budget in the long run. I'm constantly amazed when I hear other legislators talk about how if we just pass this bill, we'll have free federal money that will come down to us that we can utilize. It's, it's our money, first of all. Second of all, they don't have that money. And, and so um, we have to be very careful about what we get into with the federal government um, going forward. Uh, but that FMAP is just one, one, um, one part or one example of how um, that works as far as our partnership with them. The last thing I want to talk about, I think we're running a little behind schedule, and I think this will cover um, the budget. What I want to talk about is, it, in 2010, the governor ran on a two-year budget and a five-year projection. That's what he campaigned around the state, state saying, we're going to have a two-year budget, we're going to have a five-year projection, so we know where our expenses are going to, are, are going to be and how our budget's going to, to stand. And so this up here, and, and that was something that the governor had, the legislature did not have. And so I went to our nonpartisan fiscal bureau and said, I want to see that five-year projection. I want to see how we're doing and where we're going. And they came back with these numbers, uh, which to me were very shocking and, and, and eye-opening. Um, 2012, 13, 14, you can see that's where we built that savings account. That's where we had that huge surplus of uh, eight, nine hundred million dollars um, and built up a good savings account. This year, in 20, we're in fiscal year 2015 right now. You can see we're break even. No surplus, no deficit, give or take a, a little bit, but basically break even. Going into next year, and these numbers are a little different than what I just told you because they were um, done last year, but still the same message. Going into next year, we're $200 million short. That's where we have to find that, that gap, or else we're going to have to start digging into our savings account just to pay our bills. Um, 17, we're another $175 million short, $178 million short. The next year, $34 million short. And then the next two, where you see we're, we're back in the black, that's with the assumption that we're going to have a perfect economy going up and we're not going to spend any more money as a legislature. That's only spending that's on the books. So those are two very big assumptions, right? And so you can see my concern as someone who cares deeply about the budget and where we're going, uh, that this trend uh, is concerning and we need to do something about it. Uh, unfortunately, um, not a lot of people want to hear it. I try to tell people at the Capitol and some of the, uh, some of the Democrats that are chairing our committee, uh, the Appropriations Committee, and they literally will walk away, they don't want to hear it. Um, I'm trying to tell as many people as I can to prepare them for next January when you hear about budget fights, because that's why we're going to put our foot down and keep our budget under control. It, it's this future that we're looking at that we can't go back to the ways of spending what we bring in. And we, we saw that in 8, 9, 10. Uh, we can't go back that way. And so um, that's my message in short. Um, we need to uh, continue to stay on your legislators about uh, about this issue. Um, we cannot go down the way of the federal government, and we have to prepare for when the federal government starts cutting us off. And um, the, the last thing I would say is, uh, you guys are all extremely involved, but I would encourage you to get to know your legislators if you don't already. Give them a phone call, tell them you want to meet them for coffee, 
Um, I can't imagine there's many legislators in the state that if you called and said, I want to go out to coffee for a half hour, let's sit down and talk, I can't imagine hardly any would, would not take you up on that. Uh, they might not agree with you, but uh, it's amazing how many, one, how many, how much one or two or three phone calls from your constituents can change your mind on issues. I've literally had people in, in our Senate chamber change their mind because three or four people called in that day on the day of a vote. So you have a voice. Um, our districts are not that big. I only represent 60,000 people. Um, get to know them and you can't make a difference. I, I promise you, your voice will matter to them. If you call them, email them, go meet with them, you can make a difference. So I appreciate um, you guys listening. I will try to get the PowerPoint out uh, with all the numbers. I threw a lot at you, but um, that's our quick update on the budget and I, I'm just happy that you invited me to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Well, our next speaker is the Republican candidate for Iowa State Treasurer. He's formerly a candidate for U.S. Senate. He's currently a tenured full professor of economics at a private liberal arts college in Northwest Iowa. Originally from rural Kansas, he accepted an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado and commanded the 70th Fighter Squadron and retired as the Inspector General of the United States Space Command and the North American Aerospace, Aerospace Defense Command. And after 25 years, he achieved the rank of full colonel. He earned an MBA from Golden Gate University and studied at Georgetown University in the National Security Program and earned his doctorate in public administration from the University of Alabama and then entered the field of higher education. He's taught various other institutions, including Iowa State University in the Master's of Public Administration program. Now I could go on and on because his resume looks like a novella, but in any case, uh, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, getting to know Sam a little bit, and he is a, a wealth of information, and I would ask you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Sam Clovis. It's great to be here today and uh, to be in this uh, August gathering, and I was really excited when Shane invited me uh, to be part of this very first uh, caffeinated thoughts briefing, and I, uh, I accepted eagerly, and we figured out a way to get it into our schedule, and I, I'm just uh, delighted to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces in this room, and that's, there's good news and bad news to that. Uh, the good news is it's always great to be around friends. The bad news is we need to get more people out here so we can meet more folks. And that is a little bit of what I was gonna, I'm going to talk about today. I had another speech planned all together. I had uh, been ruminating over what I would say and I had the opportunity, you know, thought that I'm, I'm typically a very uh, placid and non-emotive, uh, monotonic, 